411 this morning. Number 411, let's all stand together. Let's begin to worship our Lord today. Number 411, on the solid rock. Number 411, sing it out to the Lord today. Is there any, are we online guys? Just can't see it, huh? That's all right. Good to have everybody online with us today. Let's have a great day in the Lord. Let's get our minds focused on Him. Drop all the other junk that's going on in the world. Just drop it. Leave it out there on the side of the road somewhere. And just look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And uh, man, I'll tell you what. I'm excited to be at church today. Amen. Here we go. Let's sing it with all of our heart. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I His oath. How many things have got to keep his oath? His covenant. How many things got to keep his covenant? Support me in the whelming flood. That's what we come to. You know, we need, God knows we need that reassurance of his covenant, of his oath, of his promise, of his sureties in our life. This world will make you think that God uh, has forgot about us or where's God at in all this. He's still there, amen? amen? He's right here this morning. Let's sing verse number three and sing it to the Lord. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the blood. We all around my soul be slain. He is all my hope and saved. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. you're our solid rock today that we can rest on the foundation Lord laid before the foundation of this world we're thankful for your oath for your covenant for your blood and we're thankful God that you have supported us and will support us and hold us through the floods of iniquity in this world now God today I thank you that you set aside the first day of the week to worship you I pray God that we'll worship you in spirit and in truth Lord Enable us by the power of your spirit, Lord, to literally and honestly not play church. But, oh, God, to let the sweet spirit of God speak truth to us and righteousness and holiness before the Lord. God, I pray today as folks come in that they would sense the presence and the power of Almighty God. I pray, God, that nothing would hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not grieve nor quench, Lord, his blessed presence. And Lord, I pray today that Jesus Christ, our Savior, would be lifted up and glorified in every expression on our faces, in every look in our eye, in every word that we say, every song that we sing. God, may you be glorified. Lord, you are truly worthy. Lord, this morning as I think that around thy throne, they're crying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, God help us to look up to you and cry, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Lord, we just appreciate the truth this morning. God, I could be in hell. Lord, I could be out there somewhere doing something stupid, Heavenly Father. Ignorance of pet. Lord, just so ignorant. 
and Lord, unknowing of Christ. And God, I thank you that somebody carried the gospel to me. Help us to carry the gospel to others today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, the teen class will stay up here. Uh, the other classes you are dismissed. And we'll uh, get into Bible class. We're going to dismiss about maybe five or ten minutes early if we can today. <clears throat> but you're dismissed to your classes today. <clears throat> Take your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 this morning. Romans chapter 12. We're uh, in this uh, journey through the book of Romans. And uh, this morning we're in chapter 12 where uh, we're looking at these spiritual gifts. And uh, oh my, as I was going through these again, it's like the Lord said, Reg, you didn't know how bad you needed to go back through these, did you? And uh, now, uh, Sister Connie, uh, I don't know where she's at, but I want to try to order a bunch. Is, is it, Sister Connie, is it possible? Is she back over in there? She's not in there. She's back there somewhere. Anyway. Uh, we'll talk to her, but I'm going to try to get ordered a rush order uh, of these booklets if I can. <clears throat> so we have enough for everybody. A lot of new folks in church that may not have a, a booklet. But uh, anyway, Romans chapter 12. And uh, we're going to pick it up at about verse number 3 where we left off last week about not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And so then we, <clears throat> but remember this, that Paul has laid the foundation of the gospel and the fact of the law and sin and death. Then he moves to the remedy for that uh, in chapter uh, 3 and, and uh, that Christ is God's remedy for our sin. Amen. Christ is God's remedy for our sin. And he sets forth the great principles of justification and righteousness and redemption and all that and moves through comes up to chapter 8 and tells us that that life that, that, that God has given us in Christ, that it is uh, only livable through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And man, if you don't get anything else out of this Bible class this morning, get this. You will never live a Christian life apart from the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You just well throw your flesh in the ditch and forget about it because it ain't going to please God. It might fool yourself for a while, but it will never fool God. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he talks in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit is mentioned so much. But I'm also thankful for Romans chapter 7 which teaches us about the inadequacy of the flesh and the failure of the flesh. And then moves to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get into Romans chapter 5, and I love this. I, one of the reasons that I love Christianity, I love the Bible, is because of its practicalness. <clears throat> Christianity is practical. You walk out of this church with it, and it'll do you good. But again, it has to be lived and, and outlived in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to get in now to very serious and very honest, practical Christian living. Um, Abraham Lincoln said one time, supposedly, who knows the quotes. You know, I don't believe hardly anything I read is outside the Bible. I don't know who's saying it, you know, you know, so-and-so said, well, it's okay, so who said so-and-so said? Who said said said? Amen? But anyway, he supposedly said that uh, he, he had never joined a church, but he would if he found one that loved, where they loved one another. But he never did find a church where they loved one another, so he never joined one. Well, I'm going to tell Abraham Lincoln this, uh, I, I, if, if I see him, which I don't know whether I will or not, but I say, why, didn't you, why don't you just join one and show us how it's done? Amen. So you're sitting outside the church saying y'all don't love each other, so I'm not going to join you. If you wait to find a church where they all love each other like them, I don't think you'll ever find one. Now, we, we ought to endeavor to do that, but you're going to hit spots in your life where you're going, to realize, you're going to say, if this is Christianity, I'm not sure I want anything to do with it. If this is the way Christian people treat one another, don't sit there and play possum on me this morning. Let's get real. Now, you can live in an, arti you can live in an artificial world if you like, but it won't get you anywhere. Life is real. You, you, and I'll prove it to you. You're, how many of you married people ain't never had a rojo? You've never had a rojo since you got married. Well, you just had to get married last week, maybe. You know what I'm saying? You get married, you're going to have problems with the one you may love the most in this world. It's not always going to go great. You're going to have disagreements, friction, stuff like that. That happens in the body of Christ. But here is the secret. <clears throat> My daddy... Uh, I, you know, I'm so old that you hear all my stories over and over again. Amen. <laughs> my daddy, my mom put me in the garden. We had a garden. I mean, he's huge, huge. And I mean, talking about long, long roads. It's bigger than this building right here. Long roads. It's right beside the, that little cow barn. Anyway, one day they were putting up the hay and he said, Reggie, your mom wants you to plow the corn rows out with the garden tiller. 
He said, that's garden tiller using oil real bad. And he said, I got you some oil sitting over here. And he said, you, you put, check the oil on that thing when you get down to each end because it's old and, you know, but if you keep oil, it'll be all right. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't like it being put there in the garden anyway. And of course, I don't know what you think about when you're doing this all day long, you know, down through there. But I was going down through there and I never did check the oil. And I was going down through there and I mean, kaboom, a cannon went off and it blowed, it blowed the side of that motor out of that, that garden tiller. And of course, my dad got back up there and I got a bad whooping. I mean, he whooped me all over that garden. <clears throat> That's what, anyway, I'll get off of that one. <laughs> you know what my dad knew? And if you don't keep oil in the engine, you're going to have a lot of friction. <clears throat> and if you don't keep oil, uh, David said, I should be anointed with fresh oil. Yes. And there is somehow that you say, well, well Reg, I don't understand it. Well, the Holy Spirit's God, but there's something about the refreshing of the Holy Spirit that we need. It's kind of like, it's kind of like oil change. Yes. Or kind of like, you know, check the oil, add some oil. And the Holy Spirit is typified as oil in the Bible. And you and I need a fresh anointing. We need fresh touch from God. And, and, and if we have oil, <clears throat> things run a lot smoother. Not near as much friction. The answer to any church, to any family, to any marriage, to any relationship is more oil. Amen. Amen. And it just is. Now, this, this is what God did. He said there in verse number <clears throat> four, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. That's unbelievably powerful truths that need to be brought home to our heart. Not just read, but, but literally got a hold of. We're not isolated people here. We are many. I have many members to my body, but I have one body. And all, as far as I'm concerned, all my members are important. <laughs> I don't want this little finger cut off. I don't want this ear cut off. I don't want my knee hit. All the members are important. Need to get that down. <clears throat> then he said, verse number six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. God does this. He has seven, diff seven different spiritual gifts he's going that he gives to save people, people in this body. And it's been given to us according to the grace of God. And then he lists them. Number one is prophecy. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to proportion of faith. Ministry, the second one, let us wait on our ministry. He that teacheth, that's the third one on teaching. He that exhorteth on exhortation, that's the fourth one. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, that's the fifth one. He that ruleth is the sixth one, do it with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, and mercy is the seventh one. And these are the seven spiritual gifts listed in Romans chapter 12. Now I'm going to ask you a quick, I'm going to say something to you. Every saved person in this building has one of these spiritual gifts. And what I want you to be able to do in the next seven weeks is to identify what is your specific spiritual gift. And I want you to be thinking about what is my spouse's spiritual gift? What is my children's spiritual gift? Uh, you young people, it would be very wise for you to think, what is my dad's spiritual gift? What is my mother's spiritual gift? And through that, you'll see them in a brand new entire light. I was sitting in Oklahoma City when I first heard the teaching on this. I never knew it existed. That's the honest truth. I had shied away from spiritual gifts teaching because of the misuse and the charismatic movement. And I just about wouldn't have anything to do with that. <clears throat> I just knew what was going on. I, what I saw going on was not biblical. I knew that much, but I didn't understand some stuff. <clears throat> so today we're going to look at the first one, which is prophecy. But I was sitting in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and this man began to teach on it. My wife was sitting beside me, and he began to do what I'm going to do here this morning, talk about the uses of it and the misuses of it. And as he began to list the misuses of the gift of prophecy... I sat there and it was like having a picture painted of, of the real me inside. And I was stunned. I mean, I was literally stunned. I knew he didn't know me from anybody. I was sitting in a crowd of probably 3,000 people. How could this guy so detailed describe my inner person? Well, he did it from the Bible. Because the, the sword of the Spirit 
pierces soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. And the word of the spirit can pierce. Search me, O God, and know me. And that's what this does. It's so important. Now, here's what happened. First of all, I was able to see myself as other people were seeing me. I had never seen that before. That was important. Because I began to understand why they reacted to me. You ever wonder why? Well, why they act that way for? Then I began to see other people. I saw my wife for the first time in a completely new light that caused me to understand why she was why she would say things, not say things, act certain ways, respond certain ways. I began to see, all of a sudden that's like I learned who my wife was. And then I began to try to understand my children and, and that wasn't as easy for me. You know, they were in the growing up stages and so forth. It wasn't as easy. But uh, we're going to start off then today with this gift of prophecy. Now, Peter is your guy in the Bible who has a, every spiritual gift has a main character in the Bible who represents the person that has that, the people that have that gift. Okay, do I need that? Probably do. Sorry, guys. But uh, thank you, Brother Joel. Appreciate it. Um, Peter is the man that uh, represents the gift of prophecy in the Bible. Now, let me just say, make something real clear. The gift of prophecy here is not God showing me new revelation of the Bible. It's not that at all. The gift of prophecy is the proclamation, the gift of proclamation of what already is in the Bible. It's not adding to what God has said. It is proclaiming what God has said. And in, with a specific emphasis on righteousness, sin, and judgment. Now get a hold of this, because I'm going to tell you something. If you live with the prophets, you better get this. If you sit in the church where the preachers are the prophets, you better get this, because it'll help you to understand me. And that's why, I need to, that's why I need to understand you when your spiritual gifts. And when we get done with this seven weeks from now, then we're going to have a session where people can say... Uh, Brother uh, Lakey, you told me one time this teaching helped you to understand your dad. Could you say anything about that at all? Or just Well, I don't know. A lot of people didn't understand my dad. He was pretty blunt and direct, but he was, I mean, he had gift of prophecy. He was going to tell you like it was, whether you liked it or not. Yeah. I remember him telling me this years ago. I think this is the third time that we went through this in the last 30 years here. But it, it so struck me because it enabled that boy, that I don't, not calling you a boy, you're a man, but that son, that's a better word, to understand his father and why his father said, did, had the attitude that he had. And he began to see it from a different light. That's a gift of God. And yes, it can be used. But I need to understand what it is and be, understand when dad's misusing it or whether he's using it right. So Peter is this. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys to put some scriptures up on the wall. If you can, <clears throat> I want you to put up. Uh, here, if you want to write these down, if we get the booklets in, we'll try to get them. But number one, a characteristic of the gift of prophecy is the need to express yourself. You just feel compelled to express yourself. You just can't hardly stand to let that go and not, not be countered. <clears throat> prophets need to express their thoughts and ideas verbally, especially when matters of right or wrong are involved. I mean, I read these things and I just, again, it's just I see myself painted. I see something that's not right. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'll tell you how bad I am on this. I was going around the square at Ava one time and this guy was beating up on this guy and this guy was just taking it. He had him up against the car, just fisting him. And everybody's standing around watching it. You know, and I was like, what are you guys letting this go on for? And I just walked, I mean, I, I walked right up to him. And I just said, hey, what's, what, what's going on? What, what are you hitting him for? And he mouthed off something. And I looked at that guy and said, why are you letting him hit you like that for? And I was like, you know, I don't like this. People don't not be sitting in the middle of the square in Ava beating on each other. Right. You know, anyway. <laughs> if you read the New Testament, you'll find that Peter spoke more often than any disciple there. How many ever remember Jesus, Peter always piped off? He was always spouting off. He felt like he needed to say something. Now, I'm going to tell you, the Bible said, a fool uttereth all his mind. <laughs> a fool uttereth all his mind. And so if you have the gift of prophecy, and this is what I've been fighting for 
30, 40 years, once I learned this thing is fighting off saying stupid stuff, just you know, might be right and might need to be said, but is this the time? Is this the place? Is this the people? Is, is my tone right? Yeah. Am I going to do more damage than good in my response? Uh, actually, Peter became the spokesman for the early church. When Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, who was it that stood up and said, I got something to say to y'all? And boy, he didn't hold back. So they need to express themselves. But the misuse of that is this, that they will expose people without restoring people. Now you watch this. Galatians 6.1 says, let him that is spiritual among you, we're talking about spiritual gifts, talks about if, if any man be overtaken in a fault... Let him which is spiritual among you restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering himself, lest he also be taken. God says if you're going to restore somebody, do it in the spirit of meekness. Do it in the spirit of understanding. It could have been you. And give them some slack. Now I'm going to tell you what's funny. I'm watching your eyes and your faces, and I can almost spot your spiritual gift by the way you respond to statements. That's the truth. I've already spotted some people's spiritual gifts. I'm watching your faces, and I can all, the response that you, there are some people going, I don't know about that. Other goes, see, it, the, you're, you're responding to what I'm saying by, with your spiritual gift. That's the honest truth. That's why I pray and beg of you to get, if you don't get a hold of anything else, this is more important than you going to a revival meeting. I'll be honest with you. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, they want to expose sin. Uh, rather than restore somebody, and they think that needs to be done. Uh, now, here's the thing. What a prophet knows is that exposure has to be done before there can be restoration. A prophet does not want to see things covered up and act like and sin not dealt with. A prophet doesn't want anybody making a little short, quick uh, profession of faith without having dealt with his sin before God. Because he knows that he's liable to be led into a false profession. Yeah. See? So he, he, he'll, but his tendency is, he'll carefully expose without restoring. Yeah. And you can come across that way. And I've, I'm going to tell you, I've had death threats this week. I've been cussed out more this week than ever been cussed out in my life. Uh, un, I don't know what's happened. It's like an attack from hell after the camp meeting. More, and then all my life, I've been cussed out more this week and called everything you can imagine. But some of that sometimes is the way I come across. Okay? So, I'm, so I'm, you know, I, I, don't, I don't just blockhead all things that like or lump it. But there's also a point where you realize it wouldn't make any difference how you said this. They're opposed to righteousness, period. So you've got to also understand that. But there are times that your spirit can convey more heaviness and more condemnation than your message. And you got to watch out for that. Number two, a prophet will make quick impressions of people. If you want to write these down, a prophet will make quick impressions. He tends to make quick judgments about what they see and what they uh, hear. And a prophet tends to uh, uh, express their views before he hears the whole matter. Peter spoke first more than any other prophet. I could take you through situation after situation from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter would jump and speak almost. What about when Jesus said, you're all going to deny me? I ain't going to deny you. <laughs> Not me. First one pops, pops right off. They're up on Mount uh, uh, Transfiguration. Uh, Lord, he pops up and said, Lord, think about build three tabernacles, one for you, Moses, one for you, and one for... He just pops off. It's just something needs to be said. And that's funny because I, I can be in where there's people at and something is said and nobody says something. And I'm like, man, son, you got it. You know what I'm talking about. Why doesn't somebody say something? Uh, <clears throat> but the opposite of that, where you misuse it is, on the second one there about making quick impressions of people, you can jump to conclusions that are not accurate. Some of you come in here and you've jumped to a conclusion that Don Zen is a jerk. <laughs> Say amen right there, Don. Now, if you, but here's the flat truth of it. 
You see, you know one reason I understand that guy and why he and I have a, a I mean, an unbelievable relationship? Because I understand where he's coming from. Amen. And I give him slack for that. Huh? You, you just, you know. <clears throat> no, you're a good illustration of this, Brother Don. You're a good but uh, a prophet looks also that once he's made a conclusion, then he looks for evidence to prove that conclusion. Now, that's dangerous. Because you can, you, can, you can watch a trial and say, you know, I think they're guilty. But you haven't heard the facts yet. It might not be like you think it is. Number three, a prophet is alert to dishonesty. This is a big one. A prophet is very alert to dishonesty. He does not like anybody blowing him smoke and mirrors. He feels like when I'm preaching, I feel compelled to be absolutely, totally honest, whether it's me or you. Amen. I just feel like if I'm not honest, I'm a joke. Amen. Truth is, I hate myself if I deceive or lie. Amen. I mean, I just literally will about self-implode. Because of something I know, it comes with the gift. That if we don't have truth, we have no hope. Amen. Without truth, it's all gone. You can talk about the love of God all you want to. You can talk about hell. You can talk about, you can talk about anything you want to. But if you don't have truth, a basis of truth, you're shot. That's why I'm so big on the Bible. Yeah. If, if this, he said, Jesus said, my word is truth. If it's not truth, I don't have anything. That's right. I have to have truth. <clears throat> and whenever we're dealing with our children and stuff, you know, we, how many want your kids to lie to? You want truth. And you know there has to be truth for there to be true, genuine reconciliation. What did David say in Psalms 51? Behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts. Until there's truth in the inward parts, you get nowhere. And so that person with the gift probably understands that. It's just not that he's smart about it. It's just God put it in him. There are many women with gift of prophecy. Okay, They're, and they live in homes where they ain't putting up with no lie. And daddy said, oh, honey, it ain't that important. Yes, it is. He's lying to us. <laughs> yeah. She just can't stand for the truth not to come out about a matter or a situation. You're lying to me. I can see it in your eyes. And we're not going nowhere till you get honest. <laughs> okay. And uh, but, the, but the abuse of that is that a prophet oftentimes will react harshly to sinners. When a prophet sees sin, he has a tendency to denounce it with, um, str with almost an overkill if he's not careful. Now, uh, now <clears throat> let me say this to you. I'll, I'll get you on this. Jesus Christ, our Lord, had all seven gifts, Amen. all balanced perfectly. Amen. Give you an illustration. Prophecy is on the opposite polar end of mercy. Prophets and mercies do not get along. I have a child that is a mercy and difficult. He sees everything through a different lens than I see. And I'm telling you, this stuff's important. Or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, I promise you. <clears throat> uh, Jesus dealt with a woman taken in adultery. A prophet will go back like I do and say, no, 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 he didn't, he didn't, he didn't gloss over her sin. <clears throat> what that prophet will do is expose the sin of the men who brought her was not throwing her down. It was that they were violating the law themselves because the Bible said that both of them were to be stoned. You didn't just stone one. The prophet goes back beyond the whole story, back to the law that they were trying to twist and abuse to, their, to her destruction. But a mercy will only see, neither do I condemn thee. That's all they see. A prophet sees, go and sin no more. That's why we need balance of the gifts. My goal, I hadn't reached very much of it, my goal for the last 20, 25 years has been to bring in the, the other gifts to some use in my life. 
to temper my gift of prophecy with mercy. I want mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is very, very important. And so there needs to be this balance brought in. But they have a tendency, uh, a, a, a prophet will magnify sin in order to bring repentance. How many knows that repentance is a strong thing in my whole being? That's his motivation. He knows they need it. He knows God demands it. He knows without it, you got nothing. And so why are you talking about love, mercy, and happiness and all that stuff as long as this garbage is going on? See? Okay, number one, they need to express themselves. Number two, they make quick impressions of people. Number three, they're alert to dishonesty. Number four, this is a big one, they have a desire for justice. They have a desire for justice. <clears throat> one of the things that to me is missing in the preaching in America right now is the issue of justice. God is a just God. That means he executes justice. <clears throat> God just doesn't sweep our sins under the rug. He executed justice on our sins. And that execution of justice was upon his son in our place for our sin. God did not throw justice out the window. He could not be God unless he's a just God. And God just didn't throw stuff out and say, well, I'm just going to be nice and forgiving to y'all. This is where people missed it. Preachers are just preaching the love and the forgiveness of God. But upon what basis are you forgiven? Upon what basis are you reconciled? Upon what basis does he save you? Upon what basis does he reconcile you? He reconciles us totally and absolutely and completely upon the basis that he ex executed justice on Jesus Christ. For Christ also once suffered for sins. What was going on? He was suffering the justice, the punishment of God that I should have received. This is why, see, from my perspective, the whole, the whole religious mess in America is gone because we've perverted our concept of God. Yeah. Right. See, when I think about God, I know God loves me. He gave his son for me. Amen. But I know above that love is God's holiness and justice. And without that, that love, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been there. <coughs> Because God's just, our sin had to be paid for. And that justice was executed in Christ. And if you don't receive Christ, there's no other payment for your sin. You won't pay for your sin a million years in hell. Because you going to hell will not pay for your sins. There's only one thing to pay for your sin, and that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a prophet has a, a, a desire to, for justice. Now, a prophet, and I'm going to get into some some tough stuff for me right here. This is, this is rough on me. Uh, if I were sitting out there and a the guy was me and he was telling me this, I'd be sitting there going, I'd be wrestling. Okay? A prophet tends to cut off those who sin so that justice will be done and other people will be warned as a result. <clears throat> Peter wanted to cut off his offenders. He came to Jesus Christ and he said, how many times I got to forgive these idiots? He didn't say that. That's Reggie's version, okay? But, you know, in hillbilly language, how long I got to put up with this stupidity? They keep offending me and offending me and offending me and offending me. And how, how, long, what, how many times? Seven? I'll be a real Christian. I'll put up with it seven times. And if they do it seven times, it's over. We're never going to have fellowship. I don't want nothing to do with them. I don't want them around me. They have an unrepentant heart. All they want people to do is just look over their sin and wickedness and they want us to accept their... See, that's my problem with the sin of sodomy. Christ died for every sodomite in the world. Are you listen to me? But the sin of sodomy is different. Do you know of any murderer group that's trying to convince the American people that we all accept murder? Do you know of any group of rapists who are trying to convince America that we ought to embrace rape. The only group of criminals you know about in the world is the sodomites who believe that they ought to impose. You see, and, and intuitively me, every fiber, 
everything in my soul and spirit comes out against that. Because if that is accepted in this country, we are forever gone into the bowels of hell as a nation. And no, and people talk about being, it is different. It's a different sin. It's a sin that destroys cultures. Now here's what happens. As a, by the way, I've got a clip out on what the Bible says about gay sodomite. It's jumped up to, I don't know, three or 400,000 views now. And I mean, every day, I mean, I get pumped at me, messages and stuff. And my, but you're, oh, you're supposed to be a preacher and you hate. And all I do is give the, what the Bible says. I don't hate nobody. That's the truth. But what you don't see is ever, you don't ever see a spirit of repentance. Now, what will happen is a mercy, a saved person now, you listen to me, a saved person who is too warped on their, there I am, <clears throat> too warped on their mercy, Tim will say, well, you, you don't have any mercy on them. You, you, don't, you don't care about them. You just tell them they're dying going to hell. Amen. You know, Tim, you, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have known about that guy that, that threatened my life. By the way, did you know that the sheriff's, the sheriff's office up there in Arizona went and seen, paid him a visit? You bet you. Amen. Uh, Highway Patrol called me the day before yesterday. And said, we want you to know where things is at. Said the sheriff out there said, and we're is going to the prosecutor. Said he may or may not uh, prosecute him. We don't know. We don't have anything to do with that. But he said his problem would be is getting him extradited to Missouri for for, for trial. Now I want to tell you something. Oh, whatever you do, don't you threaten nobody on Facebook. Don't threaten anybody anywhere unless you mean to do something. Yeah. Don't ever pull a gun on anybody unless you intend to fire it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I've told my daughters, I said, if it comes to that point, just go ahead and pull the trigger. Because right. if it doesn't work this first shot, at least you'll know it and have time to get the second one in. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I want to tell you what a, what a prophet knows. Now, listen to me. A prophet knows the Old Testament principle of a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He knows that if sin starts slipping in the church, next thing you know, they'll recruit others to their viewpoint about that sin, and pretty soon it, it'll, tear up, it'll tear Jack up and destroy the work of the gospel. He believes strongly that a little leaven left the whole lump, so we ain't having no leaven. The, the, op, the, the problem with that is he has a tendency to be unforgiving. I struggle with forgiveness. I don't lie to you. I'm telling you, I struggle. I have to just over and over again willfully say, Lord, I just forgive. Lay not this sin to their charge. Yes, Tim. Excuse me. You know what you said about the, the Bible, what the Bible says. They don't want to hear what the Bible says. That, that's the thing. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to uh, get across to my kids as they're growing up and getting out into the world yeah. you know when you see things and you have a discussion with others about hey this is you know why are you doing this or well that's just what your parents have told you and that's what your parents have taught you and yeah. I, I, I'm trying to teach them Bible. Yes, your parents teach you things, but what does the Bible Amen. say? Amen. Where's what the does basis? the Bible say? Where's the basis for what we believe? Exactly. Now, again, this goes back to the Bible issue. Because if this Bible is not pure and perfect and preserved, we do not have a foundation. If it can be changed, you don't have a foundation. You, you, please, please don't sit there and tell yourself that. You destroy your foundation. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's what's going on in this country. The righteous, like a, a guy, I get hit with this every week. Every week, got hit hard with this week. You Christians, you've got all these Bibles and they don't even agree with each other and you claim your God knows what's going on. How stupid are you, hillbilly? That's the kind of stuff I get every week. You Christians, God can't even keep his word straight. Which Bible is it you use of the 400 versions that are out there that disagree with each other? Podunk. Yeah. 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 With a few other choice words usually added into it. Hang on, I got people everywhere. I, got, I think I saw it one, two, three. Hang on. Yes. 
what I'm hearing all all this with, with the sin of the sodomy and, and and also with how we respond to it, all has a base sin that is the same sin as pride. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or my 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 elevating, elevating your intellect above the word of God. Which we just read about in yeah. a few verses. That, that's the this, it, you know, to think yourself higher than you ought to think. What did Satan get kicked out of Glory land for back yonder and then you go ahead, man. Yes. I think the problem is that we don't as Christians in general, this is we don't know what the Bible says <laughs> because we have not studied, read to make ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a personal testimony about that. For whatever reason this week, I don't know, it's been a massive spiritual warfare for me. When I put on that clip about that boat and Jesus, Savior, pilot me, did anybody see that in here? That boat's me in that water. If you get a chance, we might even put that up on screen. I don't know, sometimes. But I just felt like I was going through this sea of wages and crashing and so forth. And, you know, I was getting all these messages and getting all these comments and all this stuff, and, you know, which I'm thankful we're reaching people that need to be reached. But I began to get internalized cankered. And you know what? This literally, this, if, if, I'm like Danny said, if, I let, if the Holy Spirit ever spoke something to me, it's go get your Bible. And I took all day off Thursday. I shut everything down and went and got my Bible. And I, I read several books. And it's a God's word. Not talking. And I just read book after book in the New Testament epistles. And I'm going to tell you, get your, brother, I'll be with you in just a second. got this right here. Yeah, you were talking earlier. Uh, and a lot of people don't know this. We deal with the sodomy thing, you know, because we have two children that have left and, and, and are doing that. Me, I don't have no room for it. It is what it is. It's the word of God. But then I have their mother who is mercy. <laughs> And, and trying to find the balance to that. But at the end of the day, we understand that God and his word is truth. Yes. And we stand on that. We pray for our children, but it's an Amen. abomination to God. My children Amen. are no different than anybody else. God's word don't change Amen. because of your children. Oh, That's right. Amen. 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 God's word don't change. It's the same. Wow, look at this. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. But that balance... It's so important because we can't just like if we throw them away, we're not representing God. God doesn't throw people away. And we've got to remember the pit he dug us out of. We've got to remember where we could have been had it not been for the mercy and the grace of God. But we still have to take that firm stand upon scripture. Brother, back yonder. I think it's really important for us to, as you said, immerse ourselves in the word of God. Because what's, you know, there's an expression, guy go garbage in, garbage out. So whatever you take in is what's going to come out of you. If you don't take in the word of God, other things will come out. And I remember when I was in Japan, there was a, somebody said something, and I started quoting scripture and did like a little five-minute sermon. And he says, that's what we need. We need people to apply scripture and, and you know, right in the moment yeah. and, and address the issue with the word of God. Speak to the oracles of God is what the Bible literally says. And we used to do that in this nation. You're right. That's exactly right. Yeah, Dean. Uh, Philip said something over there. Uh, I don't know. Then maybe this is the month Pride Month. They call it Pride. Yeah. And they have Pride parades, and they have Pride Day at, at Disney World, and the Pride goes on and on until the Pride's broke. There isn't no, no salvation. It, yeah. uh, as long as they stand over there, Pride, forget it. Yeah. That's the thing. Your time. Let, let me just say this to you, and I want to move on to the spiritual gift itself and get off of this deal because, you know, there will never be any salvation. And you cannot say that you love any lost person, regardless of what they're doing, unless you're honest with them. If you don't tell them the truth that they need to repent, that they need to receive Christ as their Savior, they need to be born again, they need to change, they need, need to be, you know, God give a new birth to them. And, and if you don't warn them about hell, how can, these people that say you're judging them, which I get, the judging thing is I get that so much. <clears throat> the fact of it is God says we're supposed to judge. Okay. 
But if you can't, you can't claim to love people if you don't warn them. What makes me, what makes me want to vomit is these people who's all the time, you need, to more, you need to be more tolerant. You need to be more kind. You need to be more, I said, I guess let them die and go to hell like you're doing. Amen. You claim I don't love them, but you never say a word to them except you're just greasing their slide to hell. And you never say a word of warning. And you claim I'm the one that doesn't love them. Extremely accurately in the, the problems that every one of these families in this church have got problems. If you stand on the word of God, you're going to alienate yourself. And that's what's happening. And he, he'll alienate himself, the one that has profit and one's a mercy and kindness and all that. The kindness is you don't accept what's going on. That's right. And you tell them the truth. That's the kindness of the deal. They won't like it. And someone else, Tim, said nobody likes it hearing the truth of the Word of God. Nobody likes it. And in this church, there's families that are, we've all got those problems. Eating up with it, okay? But I'm just telling you, if you don't stand, it's gonna, it doesn't do any good to give in at all. No. Here, here's the principle every home needs to get. Beware of child idolatry. The Bible te teaches on this. Eli did it. Samuel did it. David did it. And it got them all in trouble. Amen. You have to love God supremely before, above the love for your children or you don't love your children as you should. Because if you start loving your children more than God, you will start compromising the standards of God for the sake. And you'll make little gods out of your own children. Let's move on. Uh, on number four, uh, the desire for justice, the misuse of it is being unforgiving. And like I said, I battle, I battle for forgiveness. The, the three people God has helped me in forgiveness is Christ, number one. He, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Joseph said, uh, uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And Stephen said, lay not this into their charge. And Paul said, lay not this into their charge. There's four, three men besides Jesus Christ who gave us the example that we don't know the whole story of history that God is writing. We don't know maybe why God allowed such and such things to happen. But God is going to work all things together for good to them that love him and of the call to court. Not for everybody and everything, but we just have to remember uh, it, God, God will bring everything into judgment. He will settle everything and he knows the whole truth about every matter. But we need to forget. I have a hard time forgiving people who, you know, do what I think is stupid stuff. Okay, anyway, number five, they're open about their own faults. Uh, they're open about their own faults. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to read what it says. Prophets are as open about their own failures as they want others to be about theirs. Peter said this. He fell at Jesus' feet and said, I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, let me tell you, uh, there's a misuse to this, and we'll get to that in a minute. It's condemning, it's condemning uh, of themselves. But before I get to that, uh, there is very much importance, and this is something I would tell every preacher. I would tell every parent. When you have been wrong, confess it. If it's a pastor, there'll be more requirement of you to be honest than anybody. And I'm going to, I'm going to say something here, and I just say it by the grace of God. I would not even know how many times in the last 20 years that somebody has either called me or wrote me a letter or come and see me and talk to me and said, Reg, I've gotten more help from you than you can imagine, and here's why. I never heard a preacher get up and admit what he's done wrong. Amen. You don't act like you live in some artificial world that, that you don't sin and you don't have these problems that we all have. And I, there's been a lot of times I've got up by his pulpit and I, I said stuff I had no intention of telling. <laughs> I couldn't, you know, I felt, I don't, but I mean, you know, uh, but what I'm saying is it can become a very powerful tool of ministry if you're just honest with yourself about your own failures, about your own struggles. Peter was very honest about, you know, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Paul was an exhorter, but he was balanced. He's the one writing here. Paul said, I'm chief of sinners, very honest about himself. 
And so I would encourage you, a parent, It took God years for me to see how I had offended some of my own children. And then it took years for him to humble me enough to talk to them and say, God has shown me how I didn't do you right. How I offended you. Because you don't tell me and make me see it. The Holy Spirit has to do that. But whenever, as a parent, if you, in all honesty, you see, there's a principle in Scripture that we really need to get a hold of, and that is this. That usually when we're wanting God to work in another person's life, he's going to have to work in us first. Amen. There, I call it, I've got a message I've never preached called then. And all through the Bible, there's situations where then... God went to work. Then, God, but it was always when he did the work in that person who thought that needs to be fixed, God says, I'm gonna, I've got to work in you first. Esther is probably one of the most prime examples of this in the Bible. And Lord, help me, we're going to preach on Esther this year sometime. The book of Esther, most amazing, oh, unreal. The power that's in that book is un unreal. But God had to do a work in Esther's heart before he could ever do a work in the king's heart. And the thing I know, I don't always abide by it, but I know this, if I want God to do something in my children's heart, I'm probably going to have to let him do something in my heart first that needs to be fixed. And that's just the truth. And you'll have to work that out yourself. But that's a biblical principle that's true. Now, the misuse of, of number five, <clears throat> being open about their own faults, is that we can condemn ourselves to the point that we're no good. And I'm going to be honest with you, I fight this. I get up and preach a message, you know, and say what the Bible says, and bless God, you ought to go home and do it. And then, sister, go right out and mess up myself that week. What do you think that makes me feel like? A stinking hypocrite. And you know what I'll do? <clears throat> I'll be out there at my meal or I'll be out there doing some farm, work on the farm and, and Brother Lutz, I'll, I'll just, I'll get so disgusted with myself. And I guess I'll just be honest with y'all. I was in such spiritual warfare this week. I was out on the farm and I just put my hands up and said, God, I want out. I'm tired. I want out. Say, what did you want out for? Because I can't live up to my own preaching. Amen. But I can't not preach the word of God just because I don't live up to it. Amen. Brother Reuben Fields told me this over the phone one time. I had an issue. I called him, talked to him. He said, Reggie, you preaching God's word does not God's not going to fall off his throne <laughs> because you don't live up to the Bible. You had to have grace. You will never live up. If you're preaching the Bible, you'll never live up to it. So then what did I do? Well, I'm not going to preach it anymore. Or I'm going to soften it back down to my level. That's not what God wants. The key is this, is that, <clears throat> watch this. Remember I just got through saying he worked in them, then he worked in them. The message is then, what's going on in my life right now? God is saying, Reggie, I'm going to work on you before I work on that congregation. And I'm going to be honest with you, it is not a pretty place to be in. Because... You know, you have your pride. It's precious, isn't it? <laughs> you know. But they have a, ten a tendency to be... If you, and let me tell you something. If you're a prophet, if, if you have the gift of prophecy, and if you come in late and so forth, don't worry, get back on that. Be real careful about being hard on yourself. 
be real careful about I would advise you do not beat yourself up every week it's not going to profit you nothing be honest with yourself and then just get on your knees and say God I just need more grace I don't know what to do the thing I'm struggling with right now 68 years of age and 40 years in the ministry is like God am I ever going to grow up and be a Christian I mean, does anybody else feel like that? I mean, when am I going to grow up and be a Christian? God, it's almost too late. <laughs> anyway, number six, wholehearted involvement. Yes, Tim. Just thinking, you know, if you were able to live up to that and you never <laughs> fell and you never admitted it and confessed it yeah. you'd never be able to help some of those people that need to be able to see you Amen. confess your sins Amen. and yeah you you'd, you'd, you'd have never seen cockiness yet and arrogancy if i lived up to my preaching out they don't tell them how sorry and low it would be you know but anyway and i don't want to go off on that and make any kind of justification for anything like, but it's, it's just the truth you know uh, number six wholehearted involvement let's get through this we're about done wholehearted involvement uh uh, how many knows that, you see, I, I'm like, I'm a diving board guy. Either jump or get off the diving board. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when you dive, there ain't no coming back. We're gone. Yeah. I, that's the way I surrendered preach on January 24th, 1982. I dove off the diving board. And I said, God, I ain't coming back. And here we go. I didn't kind of ease up and say, well, I wonder how it would be to preach. <laughs> yes. Well, I've got to say this. Paul said, I am chief of sinners after he'd written half the Bible yeah. and getting ready to die. And said, I am, not all I All the way down. I am chief of sinners. That was all the way down the road. So yeah. don't beat stuff up too bad. That's, uh, it's, it's right. But, you know, uh, by the way, let me just show you how wholehearted involvement the prophet, the prophet would be. When, when Jesus came walking on the water, who wanted to walk on the water? Lord, bid me come to you. Got out of the boat. Everybody says, yeah, and he started to sink. Well, at least he got out and walked on the water. Amen. Amen. He, he holds the world's record right now. You ain't walked on the water. Amen. <laughs> but I mean, you know, he just like, if this Jesus, amen, I can, I can do all things through Christ. Amen. I'm going. Wholehearted involvement. Well, when they do that, they get impetuous. They get impulsive. They get impulsive, and they they're not careful. Uh, let me just show you how he was. You think wholehearted involvement? Jesus said, "I'm gonna wash your feet." Oh, he said, "You ain't wash my feet. I'm a sinful man." Jesus said, "If I don't wash you, you won't have no part of me." Well, then let's just wash everything. <laughs> just moving from one extreme to the other. If you're not careful, you've got to keep that balance. All right. Number seven. This is huge, and I'm taking more time. What loyalty versus truth? Because I'm not moving this to next Sunday. We're moving to the next spiritual gift next Sunday. We ain't hanging around this prophecy stuff. I've had all I want of it. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven is loyalty to truth versus people. Oh, get this one. You got. If you want to know me and understand what I'm about, and, and if you're a prophet out there, you will be loyal to truth over people, and people will take that as, you, you know, they they don't know how to handle you. And I'm bad about that. But let me just tell you, some of the greatest pain I've ever experienced in my Christian experience of pastoring is because I said I have to be loyal to the Bible. I cannot be loyal to what you're doing. And they left. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And my I just said I can't go with it. I can't agree with it. It's unscriptural. Amen. And it was like, well... We're going to go. If you don't bow down to us and you don't agree with us and you're going to, and you're going to take, we're, we're gone. And, that, and, and you're like, Lord, all I was trying to do was just stand on what your word says to do and I've got to choose your word to them. And there's something down inside my spirit that says you cannot choose people over God. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> the the uh, misuse of that is cutting people off who fail. And this is a terrible one with me. If you have the gift of prophecy, you, you look at yourself right here. You'll have a tendency. So, okay, if that's the way it is, <laughs> we're done. And that's a bad one. You're cutting people off. If God had cut me off, I'd be in hell. How do you find the balance? Have you found the balance today? No, I'm, I'm just teaching something. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't 
I need some I don't practice any of this. I just teach. You're supposed to go live this, not me, amen. <laughs> yeah. Number eight, a uh, prophet will have willingness to suffer for what's right. Uh, Peter talked about over and over in, in the book of First and Second Peter about rejoicing in tribulation, rejoicing in suffering, and so forth. Uh, he was uh, a, a prophet. Will uh, uh, God just does something in them? If they're willing to suffer. I mean, it's just like right now. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care if it costs me business. I don't care if I'm liked in the community. I don't. I want to please God, and so I'm willing to suffer the you know the disapproval or the hatred or whatever it may be for the cause of right. And that's just that, again, that's just a gift. That doesn't make me anything. It's just the way God's gift works through me. Uh, on the right side of that, on misuse, uh, lacking tactfulness in rebuking people. And I don't think I need to say any more about that. Blunt, uh, Brother Lake, him talking about his dad was blunt, you know. See, my deal is, I, I'll be honest with you, I, if I listen to something, I'm going, I want to quit monkey around, just say what needs to be said. That's my attitude. Don't lead me around the mulberry bush trying to tell me what you kind of, so I pick up what you're trying to convey. Why don't you just say it? And I get aggravated. Quit monkeying around. Just say it. And then the, the ninth one, the last one, is uh, persuasive in defining truth. Prophets have an ability to be articulate in defining what is right and what is wrong. And Peter uh, preached on the day of Pentecost uh, he said, are you talking about pointed preaching? He was preaching to these people. said, ye have taken when with wicked hands have crucified the Savior. And great conviction came and 3,000 people were saved. And so the, uh, the, the, the misuse of that is this, is they dwell on the negative. Dwell on the negative. And I'm telling you, I have to work on this. If you have the gift of prophecy, be careful, don't dwell on negative stuff. Nobody wants to be around somebody who's just negative all the time. You know, hey man, let's look up. Our Redeemer liveth. He's coming back again. He saved us, gave us eternal life. Let's dwell on the positive, the good things, the right things. Keep on the sunny side, amen? But a prophet, if you're not careful, just everything's bad and getting worse. And I don't like that. I don't like to be around that either, amen? All right. Well, we got through that one. Lord gives, has to give special grace, you know, to put up with people like him. Amen. Anyway, uh, we have today, and I think I'm going to do this right now, a special gift uh, person with us. Brother back there with, I can't even remember your name now, but you're Jacob's brother. Would you come with your child? Your, what, what, right here, right here. I'm, there, right. They're, I want, they're, they're going to take about three minutes if you can. And they're going to share a testimony about God's grace and work in their life. This is Jacob's uh, brother, Charles, Charles my wife, Lacey. and Lacey. And boy, it's so good to have you. And you're younger than Jacob, right? I uh, know. I'm actually older than you. <laughs> I was just kidding. I just want to see if I can get a rise out of him. Yeah, right. All right. But anyway, uh, let me just, you can have this. Uh, let me just take my mic. And uh, this is Lacey? Yeah, this is Lacey. Lacey. You can. Anyway, you can just talk into that mic all on your mind. How about Yes, sir. Well, I actually, uh, my dad gave me a hard time saying that I probably talked for 20 minutes. So I tried to summate everything down to just a few minutes. So hopefully I do a pretty good job. Uh, so this is my daughter, Charlie, and she has a severe medical condition known as uh, spinal muscular atrophy type 1. And so by the grace of God, Charlie, my daughter, was given to my wife, Lacey, and myself. Um, again, she has a severe condition called spinal muscular atrophy, and basically she shouldn't be alive today. She should have passed away about two years old. Um, right now, she's two and a half years old, so thank God that she's here. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So in the past, these kids, they used to shut down. Their bodies would just shut down and they'd, they'd pass away slowly. Uh, so most doctors would just give this, uh, you know, the testimony of, uh, well, I shouldn't say testimony. They, they, they would just basically say, go home, love your kids for as long as you have them, just hold on to them. And uh, it, was, it was pretty hard. So her life has been a struggle since she was born and it will continue to be a struggle. She doesn't do what normal two-year-olds do. As you can see, she's in a wheelchair, nor will she ever follow the standard path of life. Um, even for those struggles, Charlie's, has, Charlie's life has been and continues to be a testament to the miracles of God. I feel God calling me to share some of those miracles and blessing, which is why I'm before you guys today. Uh, firstly, my wife and I married in 2016, and we had uh, struggles with infertility for about two years. And uh, those struggles were 
were difficult, but uh, that actual struggle for infertility was one of our first miracles, actually. Uh, so Charlie was born in October of 2019, and she was a happy, healthy child. And our second miracle came in the form of a random blood test that she received seven weeks later. Charlie was random, randomly selected, one out of more than 10,000 other newborns in our state that, to be tested. The test showed that she had spinal muscular atrophy. Some of the doctors told us just to love our baby as long as we had her. As I said before, five years ago, children with Charlie's condition did not live past two years of age. The miracle of our infertility showed itself through the medication Charlie was able to receive uh, just a few weeks later. Uh, if my wife and I had our daughter in 2017, when we had originally planned for it, uh, then there would have been few options for her, none, of, none as fruitful as, as you see before you today. Um, in 2019, there was a newly released medication to help treat children with spinal muscular atrophy. Not only was Charlie randomly selected and tested, but she was also able to get the medication very quickly. And this was our third miracle. The medication was $2.5 million, and insurance came through very quickly. Uh, my grandma prayed for it. We had a group on Facebook that prayed for us, and uh, we felt God's presence with us. Um, she actually was able to get the medication 11 days later, which was one of the fastest in the U.S. So uh, with, with these kids, as, um, as they're growing, they slowly lose that, that development and they, they don't gain it back. So she lost her uh, ability to move her arms and her legs. Um, and uh, she, though that movement normally typically does not come back. What you see today is actually a miracle, just the movement in itself. Uh, whenever she was nine weeks old, she was barely able to feed, but that's when she remo uh, received her medication. And in March of the following year at six months old, Charlie was found to be swallowing her food into her lungs. So doctors, um, you know, immediately put her in for surgery to give her a G-tube so she could eat by, uh, via G-tube into her stomach. Uh, this was actually our fourth miracle. Our doctor, our doctor practiced an outdated method that they don't even utilize anymore, and uh, he was able to actually understand that she was uh, aspirating, and that, again, led us to be able to actually have our child with us again, uh, you know, even longer. He was able to determine that she was swallowing the food, and then uh, they placed the G-tube, and again, that gave her the ability that she has today. Uh, over the next couple of months, Charlie lost all of her ability to eat by mouth and to use her oral skills. Normally, these things are taken for granted, and no one pays attention to how much effort goes into the task of moving, grabbing, eating, and swallowing just food. But I tell you, watching a child struggle with it is heart-wrenching and painful. Uh, we have struggled for about two years now, building back up her strength in her arms and helping her grow, move, and be able to live life. And by a miracle from God and plenty of hard work by Mama, Charlie has regained her ability to eat solid food by mouth, as well as to move her legs and get around in her wheelchair, as you guys can see. And our most recent miracle was the gift of a gait trainer, and Charlie has begun to learn to walk at home, which is unheard of. Uh, and the single greatest thing that I think that I have learned through this whole experience is that God meets us halfway. All we have to do is try our best, then leave the rest to faith, and he will take care of us. I believe this in my mind. I see it in Charlie's life, and I feel it in my heart. God is alive and performing miracles every day. All we have to do is look around and see the blessings for what they are. Even in the darkest time, light still shines. I'd like, g give me some, I'd like to hear just mama's perspective just for a little bit. Is that, is that okay? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's been one miracle after the other. You know, it, um, it was hard at first. I was in a dark spot and, um, you know, he, he kept me leading on the right direction. And then it just, it was hard not to focus on that these weren't, um, Miracle, these weren't things that we were doing. It was something that God was doing. So, um, yeah, that w that's been the biggest blessing. And then just watching her every day do things she shouldn't be doing. So, so yeah. Wow. I want to say something to all you young people out there. <clears throat> you get married, you don't know what gonna, you're going to get hit with. And, um, but just, boy, I, I hope you'll remember this couple right here, how God has given them grace. And I want to thank you all for coming and sharing your testimony with us today. And I want us to stand today and I want us to pray for this family. Would you do that with me? And, uh, and this is Charlie, right? All right. Look at there. He's teaching her. She's folding her hands in prayer. Oh, my mercy. Boy, I tell you what, what a blessing. Father in heaven, Lord, we, in deep humility... 
come before you today and thank you lord for so many things we think of right now number one lord i thank you that these this couple did not abort this baby that they didn't throw this baby away and that they received her as from you i thank you lord for their faith in christ for their trust in your word and lord for the hope and the joy and the faith that you've given them and god i i've never been where they're at don't have no idea in this world what this would be like but lord i pray that you would bless them abundantly supernaturally in so many ways god may this be a journey of faith that will inspire people to trust you no matter what they get hit with and lord i pray especially in the times when it's hard when there's nobody around when they seem to get overwhelmed oh blessed holy spirit come in and undergird and hold them through those days lord we thank you for these special young people even here in our church lord that have been such a blessing to us and added so much to this church i think lord what we would have missed lord without some of these special people that you sent to our church and we want to praise you today and thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your salvation. And we thank you, Lord, for Charlie being in church with us today. God, give her good days, I pray, and bless her mom and dad in a mighty way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'll tell you what you can do right now. You better have to do a bathroom break <laughs> and a drink of water. We're going to sing a congregational song. Turn around shake hands, somebody. Let's do that right now. The service is going to be different today.